Hello and welcome to the University of Leicester School of Business. I'm James Fitchett, Professor of Marketing. Now that you've completed the first module of your MBA with us, you're equipped with the core skills that you can apply to the second module, which will help you critically analyse key organisational processes involved with the creation and delivery of value. As you know from your own professional experience, organisations have many different strategic objectives and aims. They operate in different markets, regions and industries. Some organisations deliver services whereas others supply products. Some organisations serve consumers directly whereas others have relationships with other organisations as part of complex supply chains. Some organisations operate in commercial markets whereas others service government or public clients. Many organisations aim to generate profits for shareholders, whereas other non-profit organisations use different performance indicators. While there are an almost infinite range of differences and varieties of organisations, we can say that they all have one thing in common. They all aim to deliver value to their clients, customers and stakeholders. Value creation is a core concept for all businesses, from small to multinational, public and private, global and local. This module will bring together insights from a group of experts from across our School of Business to show you why value is central to business administration, how value is created, delivered and evaluated, and how value is at the heart of every successful and sustainable organisation. Now, most management education has a tendency to put various organisational processes and functions in different discrete boxes or units and considers each as a separate area of activity. Many MBA programmes, for example, include modules on topics such as operations management, marketing and strategy, and innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as finance, accounting and organisational behaviour. The idea behind this kind of programme structure is that you can learn about each of these areas as discrete and separate processes and put them together like a kind of management jigsaw puzzle so that in the end you have a detailed and thorough overview of business administration. Now as you probably appreciate, this approach does not really reflect the reality of most organisations. Long gone are the days when businesses operated these areas as separate and discrete departments. The reality of modern business is that these business administration processes take place together and at the same time. They are integrated across the whole spectrum of organisational life. This does not mean, however, that these different areas do not have their own processes, cultures and practices. Finance people often see the priorities of the organisation quite differently from those in human resources, for example. The priorities of operations and logistics are not always the same as the activities that marketing professionals consider to be the most important. The real challenge for business professionals nowadays then is to be able to efficiently and effectively navigate between these different areas of activity to produce a coherent, integrated and consistent strategy which can be successfully implemented so that value is created and communicated to the intended client, customer, market segment or stakeholder. To understand how you can do this requires us to look at all of these different processes together as parts of one whole. The problem is that these different organisational areas, such as operations, innovation and research and development, and marketing and branding and communications, can often see the challenges facing the organisation in very different terms. It is if, it's as if professionals in the organisation can each observe and analyse the same issue, challenge or problem, but come up with very different ways to solve them. Hello, I'm Steve Conway and I'm Associate Professor of Innovation. I met a number of you a few weeks ago at Masterclass. I tend to agree with you, James. Uh, it reminds me of the ancient Indian parable of the blind men and the elephant. A group of blind wise men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch of which we are capable. So they sought it out and when they found it, they groped about it. In the case of the first person, whose hand landed on the trunk, they said, 
This being is like a thick snake. For the second person, whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for a third person whose hand was upon its leg, they said the elephant is a pillar like a tree trunk. The fourth blind man, who placed his hand upon its side, determined the elephant is a wall. A fifth blind man, who felt its tail, described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk, stating the elephant is that which is hard, smooth and like a spear. The parable is a warning against the idea that there is only one way to see the world. The simple reason is that our perception and professional experience can often lead to limited interpretations, and thus misinterpretations. In the case of the blind men, each is correct in their analysis, but their conclusions are wrong. The important message we need to take away from what you are discussing here, James, is that an organisation, whether or not it is big or small, is actually not only one entity, but rather an amalgamation of a range of different ideas, perspectives, cultures and attitudes. No one would disagree with you that the, the different parts of the organisation need to work together. The more important question for me is how they can do this in a way that creates and delivers value. Hello, I'm Elke Weick. I'm Associate Professor in Organisation Studies. Before we can discuss how to create and deliver value, Steve, it might be useful for us to begin by saying what we think value is and why it is important for the organisation. Before we do that, though, I think it's just as important not to overlook the underlying influence of power, resources and control in organisational practice. While I tend to agree that there are different positions of view on what constitutes value, how it can be created and how it should be best delivered, which is what I think you both are getting here, it is also necessary to acknowledge from the outset that not all views have equal weight, power or authority in organisational discourse. What I mean by that is that some groups in organisations seem to have a louder voice than others, and this has a big influence on what decisions get made and why. We need to understand that all these different views and perspectives can underpin many organisational tensions and politics. For example, we seem to be living through a period where the financial and accounting view of what constitutes value and value creation is deemed to be more legitimate than any other differing view. Many organisations seem to be most interested in their share price than anything else. There is a danger that if one point of view dominates the culture of business, lots of potential value creation is lost because other voices are not heard. How about this parable? Six blind elephants are discussing what men were like. After arguing, they decided to find one and determine what it was like by direct experience. The first blind elephant felt the man and declared, men are flat. After the other blind elephants felt the man, they all agreed. Can I just interrupt you there, Elke, and state for the record that no elephants were harmed in the making of this module and that we do not condone any form of discrimination aimed at the partially sighted or the visually impaired. Also, that we do not condone any form of gender bias in the implication that the wisdom is solely a characteristic of men. Apologies if you think I'm being overly pedantic here, it's just that my marketing expertise causes me to be very sensitive to the way that different audiences read and interpret various messages. And the last thing I'm sure you want to produce here is a series of complaints from outraged and obsessed students. Can I impress on you both the need to bear in mind the high student satisfaction scores that we want to get for this module, and I'm also a little worried that we might be getting into hot water with the Elephant Protection League. If we're not careful, we'll have to approach the Dean and ask for a, bu a budget to donate to the Elephant Conservation Trust. Thank you, James. I think you've demonstrated very clearly just why marketing experts are often considered to be so annoying. Anyway, uh, you seem very concerned to move your focus away from questions of value creation, processes of value, to what people may or may not think about a perfectly instructive parable. I think we all agree that if there is any negative feedback on social media or Blackboard, we'll all leave it to you and your marketing colleagues to weave your marketing arts to settle any upsets caused. The point I wanted to make was that there is more than one way to understand value and value creation processes. I think we can all agree that understanding value creation is very important for all organisations, 
and that those organisations that are able to design, deliver and communicate value will be more successful than those that cannot. My own area of interest is around innovation and change. From my perspective, value creation is inextricably linked to innovation. New ideas and the innovations that arise out of them are the lifeblood of an organisation. The study of innovation helps us understand how individuals, teams and organisations generate new ideas, how they choose between the multitude of ideas generated and how they then go about realising these ideas. That is how they translate new ideas into new products, new services, new processes and or new business models, for example. From an innovation perspective, value is generated within organisations through these processes of idea generation and translation. It is important to reinforce at this stage, as you've already noted earlier, James, that creating value through innovation is not the preserve of the private sector organisation or those organisations that operate within technology sectors, such as telecommunications, commut computing, chemicals and biotech. Indeed, innovation has the capacity to generate value in public sector organisations, often through new public services and new organisational processes. As well, with, as well as within organisations as diverse as charities, relief agencies, pressure groups and various non-governmental bodies. Innovation is a great leveller, allowing new entrants to enter a new marketplace, for example. The corollary to this is, of course, that organisations that do not innovate or do not create value successfully through innovation are likely to face increasing pressures on their businesses and markets and the longer term will struggle to survive. Nokia and Kodak are prime examples in relation to once dominant businesses. But it's not just technology product companies that can face this threat. Innovative service organisations such as Amazon are disrupting many markets. In recent days, for example, news has emerged that Toys R Us, a once dominant force in the toy retail market, is struggling to survive. Innovation then is not only important for organisations to create new offerings to enter new markets and meet new and emergent market needs, but is vital for creating sustainable and successful businesses and organisations in the longer term. It is vital for organisational survival. The marketing concept, which is at the core of the marketing approach to value creation processes, would certainly agree with you in many respects. Organisations that are able to innovate, to develop new products and services, are absolutely central to sustainable business. I do have my reservations though. The problem with focusing on innovation, as you've described it here, is the implication that innovation is something that organisations do, rather than something that consumers drive. Successful innovation is at least as much about understanding how consumers and market trends are changing and then looking for ways to innovate so that these needs and wants can be served more effectively than conjuring up new and wonderful products and services. In fact, I would like to state here that I do not think we should be really talking about value creation processes at all. Value is not created, in my view, at least not by organisations. Organisations and businesses often make the mistake of thinking that they create the value which is then delivered or sold to buyers. They don't. A better and more up-to-date view would be to say that value is co-created in the partnership or relationship between customers and organisations. An innovation is no innovation at all if customers do not value or want it. Customers are the main drivers of innovation, not organisations. All organisations need to institute ways, ways to get close to and understand its customers and then use this understanding as a starting point to work out what they can do to serve those needs and wants. Yes, James, customer needs are of course important and market research is obviously one of the ways that organisations can learn about these needs and wants. But I think it is also important not to get too theoretical or philosophical about it, about this issue of value creation. There are some very basic, practical and process-driven aspects of value creation that can be overlooked in this debate. Innovation and research and development processes are excellent for showing what innovations might be possible, but there is always the risk that they will fail because of a lack of market fit. On the other hand, marketing has succeeded at communicating and branding products and services to customers in increasingly sophisticated ways. But the risk here is that customers can often end up with more of the same, but with different branding or positioning. 
in between those two opposing organizational approaches, there are a range of operational drivers that are equally important, if not more so, but that are easily overlooked. Customers do not always want new and improved versions. They often are just as likely to value consistency, quality, efficiency and convenience for existing market offerings. Competitive markets in many aspects of life have been extremely effective at delivering these benefits to customers, but not necessarily through innovation or good marketing, but through effective operations management. Online retail, for example, has come to dominate many categories and would not be possible if it were not for continuous innovation in information technology, the use of database technology and so on. And marketers have successfully promoted the benefits of online shopping, develop powerful online brands and overcome customer reservations around trust and so on. But equally important to the success of online retailers such as Amazon, for example, are the operational strategies around distribution management, logistics, inventory control and so on. The value proposition of online retailers is mainly achieved through efficient operations management. For example, customers often value lower prices, higher quality, both of which are reliant on operational design considerations rather than clever marketing or rapid innovation. The real innovation in modern business is not necessarily about new products and services, but about innovations in operations management. More importantly, customers do not necessarily see these processes. They very quickly come to take them for granted, but this does not detract from their importance in the value creation process. That's interesting, Elke, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying here. Indeed, innovation is certainly about much more than new product development or service development, but encompasses all aspects of organisational processes, including operational considerations. This is what I would refer to as an innovation-led organisation, one that is organised to embed ongoing innovation in all aspects of its processes. When we think of innovation, we typically think of new products and services, often those based on technology. The iPhone and the iPad are often presented as examples. This view is undoubtedly reinforced by the academic literature on innovation, which overemphasizes products, technology and the private sector, although interest in service innovation is certainly increasing. But Elke, you're quite right. Innovation is more than just new products and services. I take a fairly broad view of innovation, so I would see innovation, as I said earlier, as also incorporating new processes, new modes of organising and new ways of doing business. Earlier, James, you said that customers are the main drivers of innovation, not organisations. I'd like to return to this notion and reflect upon it in relation to models from the innovation literature, in particular the linear models of innovation and the interactive or coupling model of innovation. These models help us to consider the process of creating value through innovation in relation to the manner in which customers and the marketplace are considered during the innovation process by organisations. There are two linear models of innovation. The first is called the technology push or science push model. The second, the market pull or need pull model. In the former, organisations are viewed as innovating in isolation, driving innovation from their R&D or product service development departments. These innovations are then passed to others in the organisation to manufacture, deliver and eventually to sell. In that sense, new products and services are pushed onto the marketplace with little interaction with potential customers or the marketplace. This can lead to very innovative products and services as they are not constrained by trying to develop what customers say they want, which is often something similar to what they currently want or can already get. Most customers actually find it quite difficult to imagine radically new products or services. Technology push or science push approaches can thus lead to more radical innovation, but they also have greater possibility of not meeting customer needs or desires. So taking this approach has the potential to lead to more innovative products and services, but is higher risk and more likely to lead to market failure. It is interesting to consider this tension between novelty and potential on the one hand and risk and failure on the other in relation to creation of value in organisations. In contrast, the market pull or demand pull model is an approach where the innovation process within the organisation is informed and driven by customer needs and wants. This is likely to reduce the risk of innovation, but is also likely to yield less radical innovation. 
The solution for increasing numbers of organisations is to try and combine or couple these two processes to get the best of both worlds, whilst avoiding the pitfalls. This approach is represented by the interactive model because it involves the organisation interacting with both the marketplace and the technology base, for example. This model is sometimes referred to as the coupling model since it combines the two linear uh, models, uh, that is the technology portion, the market pool approaches. In the interactive model, a key ingredient to creating value is through the involvement of a range of external actors in the innovation process, from customers or potential customers to universities, suppliers, etc. This is something that we will revisit in Unit 4 of this module when we consider the question, where do ideas come from? However, the interactive model also embraces the notion of the importance of interaction between the various organisational functions during the innovation process. So rather than product developers developing a new product and then passing it on to the manufacturing department to then manufacture and then to the sales department to sell, the various departments work together throughout the process, perhaps using cross-functional teams, for example. This picks up on a point you made earlier, James, about the importance of departments working together rather than separately or to create value. We'll be looking at how organisations organise for innovation in Unit 3 of this module. I think there is no question that customer expectations and customer satisfaction are not only important but are things that are actually driving markets and hence their companies through their strategies and operations. However, from an operations perspective that focuses on internal processes like the transformation of input to output, I would like to emphasize the notion of quality. I would like to do that first because these internal processes of the company are much more controllable than customer attitudes, satisfaction and so on. Which means that in terms of planning, strategies, resource distribution and so on, companies have a much better grip on that particular aspect of the value creation process. And although, of course, it is correct that we nowadays tend to define quality, even in operations management, as something that the customer defines, there is still a considerable dimension of adherence to technical specifications when we are talking of manufacturing goods or of benchmarking that come into the measurement of quality. I think this needs to be recognised when we are talking about value. Quality is never far away. There is even, that is even more true when we are looking at long-term success. I would agree with almost all of this. It's clear that innovation and operations, when looked at in these terms, is important to the value creation process. But I do think it's important to emphasise key points of difference. The first thing I think we can all agree on is that value, contrary to how it's most commonly understood, is rarely, if ever, a quality of things, as one might say. When we say that this product or this service is valuable, we can sometimes draw the conclusion that the value is somehow embedded in the thing itself, when in most cases the value is better thought of in terms of process or design. The old saying that economists know the cost of everything but the value of nothing is a good illustration of this idea because it picks upon the common sense association between value and cost. That in some sense value is a surrogate measure of the price or cost of something. A marketing approach does add to this definition of value creation though, which I think would be that we're both overlooking. Value is at least, from a marketing perspective, more about the perception that customers have about a product or service than about the product or service itself. Organisations can continue to hold on to the mistaken belief that they can control, own and deliver value, when in reality nothing has value until a customer values it. Let me give an illustration to show you what I mean. Some years ago, a piece of consumer research was commissioned in the UK to investigate how satisfied customers were with the ATM services provided by their bank. At this time, the banking industry was yet to adopt the kind of universal ATM service that is common sense to, uh, commonplace today whereby bank customers could use any ATM to withdraw cash or check balances and so on. 
customers were usually charged a fee for using the ATM machines of other bank networks, and so tended to use the ATM network of their own bank so as to avoid paying withdrawal fees to access their cash. One of the findings from this research showed that customer satisfaction for one of the main traditional high street bank brands in the UK was significantly lower than that for one of the newer, smaller bank brands that had been launched a few years earlier. The newer bank branch had no high street branches at all and was one of the first direct banking services in the UK to offer a comprehensive telephone banking service offered from call centres. This new direct bank invested heavily in customer service and routinely scored highly on customer satisfaction, which it used in its marketing campaigns to attract a growing segment of the UK retail banking market. Its customers reported the highest levels of satisfaction with their ATM network. The interesting point is that in this research was that both groups of customers, the less satisfied groups of customers of the traditional high street bank and the more satisfied customers of the new direct bank, both used exactly the same ATM network. The two sets of bank customers reported significantly different levels of satisfaction despite using the same ATM network. The direct bank was actually a wholly owned subsidiary of the high street bank. There are a couple of possible explanations we can give to account for this apparent discrepancy. One explanation is that direct bank customers were just generally more easily satisfied with a poor ATM service than the customers of the traditional high street branch. However, there was little or no evidence that this was the case. A better explanation was that the positive and high levels of customer satisfaction that the direct customers had regarding their overall banking experience was transferred to their perceptions of the ATM network. It was perceptions of the service and how they valued the ATMs. It could not be explained by the actual ATM provision. It was the customer perceptions that counted. Now I often see a very similar pattern when I look at research into product and service provision today. Consumers value products and services more highly when they value the brand. And they're even prepared to overlook many actual problems and limitations of, the, of their experience with products when perceived brand value is high. We see today that many devoutly loyal Apple iPhone users are vocal in their preference for iPhones over Samsung and other Android capable devices. However, some of the most expensive components of an iPhone are the display panel and the memory chips, all of which are manufactured by Samsung. Both Apple and Samsung benefit from this arrangement. Samsung is the only company to mass produce the high quality LED screens used in both Samsung and Apple handsets. And Samsung gets a competitive advantage from the synergy of handset and component production. It has huge facilities that make more components than it needs for its own brand of smartphones for, and so for economies of scale and it so needs big component buyers like Apple. Apple, by the way, remains the world's most valuable brand. According to Interbrand, it is valued at more than three times the value of the Samsung brand. So a marketing philosophy shows us that the customer is the value creation process. They create the value and they use the organisation as their resource to do so. Customers create value, yes, but they cannot do it out of thin air. I think we can all think of a number of companies that have been successful in their field of operations over many years by providing a consistently high quality of products. And this enables customers to build on that and to trust these products. I think in the short run you can often manipulate people into thinking the world of your product, but in the long run customers are not entirely stupid. Let me take the example of German car manufacturing. Can't think why me of all people would use that example. But companies like Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi and so on have been successful over many decades because of the consistent quality of their products and because they've always been at the cutting edge of technological innovation. 
Think of the airbag, the EPS system and many other features. They have never been the cheapest, but people have seen that they get value for money. These companies have regularly taken a beating when they thought they could cut corners. I'm thinking, for example, of the A-Class introduced by Mercedes and what became famous as the Elk Test. So Mercedes had produced its first car of the A-Class, ready to be presented at the auto salon. But when a Swedish agency tested the car on an obstacle course, pretending it had to avoid an elk crossing the road, they found that it had a tendency to overturn and crash. And you see a picture of that. This not only created huge concerns regarding safety among the customers, but almost universal ridicule regarding the engineering and why the Mercedes engineers had not thought to do these tests earlier and to construct the car in a different fashion. Here is one fake advertisement that reads, we have reinvented safety, the new A-Class. The second example is of course a more recent one and more in all our minds, I suppose. It is the emission scandal at Volkswagen, where they manipulated emission test results, again to cut corners, in that case cost corners. The damage done to the company and the brand of Volkswagen is almost immeasurable and certainly goes into the billions. This is an example of value destruction. What we can learn from these examples is that quality always pays in the long term. With regard to our present discussion, I would argue that this had nothing to do with value created by the customer and everything to do with technical quality and the quality of the operations processes. I think this dimension is also important because it allows us to bring an important to bring in important issues like sustainability, for example. This is a dimension of value creation that is located in the operations processes that is quite often invisible to the customers, but nevertheless important. Nice examples, Elke. I'd like to provide a different example, though, Nokia. I can see that customer perceptions are important for value creation in the way that you've said, James, but I'd like to pick up on something Elke mentioned. That is the importance of quality in the long term. I think time is an important consideration here. It would be interesting to determine how robust and enduring customer perceptions would be of an organisation or product range which was lagging behind the product and service development of its competitors. I noted earlier that innovation is something considered a great equaliser or leveller. I think back to my first mobile phone and it was not a Samsung or an Apple but a Nokia. Where are Nokia now? And why did such a successful company fade so rapidly? I'd argue that it failed principally in its inability to create value through innovation in the medium and long term. But then I would, wouldn't I? Thanks, Elke and Steve. I found it really interesting to listen to your thoughts and views on the value creation process. And it's been great to work on this mod module together with you both, so thanks. I think we agree more than we disagree and that we are broadly united in the view that the value creation process is at the core of the organisation of business and management. The more we can understand and appreciate the value creation process, the better we will become at analysing the many aspects of business administration. For me, our discussion has highlighted the importance of working together within organisations and the value of understanding different approaches and points of view. It will probably come as no surprise to you that I remain committed to the belief that marketing is extremely important to the organisation and that in order to succeed, everyone in the organisation needs to understand more about marketing and marketing science. I'd like to finish with this image, also a Mercedes ad, because it helps to visualise much of my thinking about value creation and the role of marketing communications. Here we see a grey, nondescript vehicle proceeding down the production line, presumably the result of countless technological innovations and complex procurement and operational systems. But it's only when the marketing work is done that the image is made and that the product comes to life and realises all of its value potential. 
Marketing is for me a value production process, not simply a means of selling or promotion. We might call it a special type of culture industry, which quite literally manufactures, creates and facil facilitates the value potential. At the end of the process is the consumer. And if in full circle, the value creation process begins and ends here, in the minds, hearts and hopes of the consuming public. Thanks, James. It has been enlightening to work with colleagues outside of my subject area, believe it or not. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that whilst business schools typically divide the discipline of management into subjects such as marketing, operations management and innovation studies, in order to make them more manageable to teach and learn, and organisations in turn typically divide their organisations into functional departments such as marketing, production and R&D. Successful managers and organisations are typically those that are able to span these boundaries and integrate these different ways of thinking. In that sense, recognising the different dimensions and drivers of value will hopefully help a better and fuller understanding of how value is created in organisations. Thanks James. Thanks Steve. Developing this module has been very stimulating and I hope it creates value for our students.